the other day there was a massive ceremony. Um, someone was here to count the city for us for a number of years. Uh, most of you all we had a day to look. And I'm going to take a lot of work and call the whole bunch of other men.
The dedicated educator is a graduate of Bramlin State University where she received her undergraduate degree. She received a master's degree in English from Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. She engaged in further study at Louisiana State University in Baton Rouge and Virginia Union University in Richmond, Virginia. She is a member of a number of locals, local, state, and national professional organizations. Though these memberships, through these memberships, she remained informed of current trends and developments in higher education. She is a member of a number of professional organizations. Among these organizations are the Louisiana Association of Women in Higher Education, for which she currently serves as state coordinator and member of the Board of Regents Statewide Articulation and Transfer Council. She is the recipient of the coveted Southern University Lifetime Achievement Award. She is a member of the Greater King David Baptist Church, where she is a member of Sunday School Class Number 3, a member of the New Membership Orientation Teaching Staff, and Vice President of the Greater King David Church Foundation. Margaret Stiles Ambrose is the mother of one son, Roderick, and the grandmother of two, Kia and RJ, that's Roderick Jr. I give you Margaret. <laughs> Principal P. A. Frazier. <laughs> Principal F. Paul Augustine. Mrs. Emma Augustine. Mrs. Ella G. Frazier. Ms. Rosa Fisher. <laughs> I thought you would chuckle on that. <laughs> yeah. Mrs. Addie C. Meyer, bridge builders of yesteryear. Mr. Leslie McCoy, Mr. Curry Stemley, Coach Lawrence Bunky Pete Williams, Mr. Gerard, the band director, Mr. Anthony Green, Bridge builders of yesteryear. Bridge builders of yesteryear. Mrs. Carrie Fisher. Mrs. Carrie Hayes. Mrs. Phyllis Cornelius. <laughs> Mr. Lemuel Bassett and Mrs. Faye Bassett. Mr. Rudolph White and Mrs. Thelma White. Mrs. H. L. W. Mike. Ms. Jean Alice Jones. Bridge builders of yesteryear. Bridge builders of yesteryear. Ms. Maggie Dobbins. Ms. Evelyn Wicked. Mrs. Luella Zachary. Mrs. Amel Glenn Day. Mrs. Alice Richmond. Yeah. Mrs. Azalea Goodo. Yeah. Mrs. K. E. W. Lolly. Yeah. Bridge Builders of Yesterday. Mrs. Lula May Hope Wilson. Yeah. Mrs. Pearson, Ruth Pearson. Mrs. And we want, to, we, we want to make sure, and I want to stop here and say, I'm not going to be able to stand here and call out every teacher. But I want to give you just, a, I want to send you tumbling down memory lane. Yeah. So that's why I'm calling all these names out now, as many as possible now, so that I can send you on a trip. Mrs. Rosetta Frazier, Mrs. Queen Esther Alfred, Mrs. Mary Benjamin, yeah. Mrs. Amy Foster, Freeze. Remember? Yeah. 
we're going on a trip down memory lane with bridge builders of yesteryear. Mrs. Lucy Hayward. Mrs. Nayla White. And Mrs. Sarah Van Dyke. And I have not called all of the beloved bridge builders of yesteryear, but I have done enough to send you tumbling, as I said, down memory lane. Some of the memories that you are experiencing now are great memories, and some might make you fidget just a little bit, because they might not be so great, but they still represent lessons learned. I want to pause and then we'll come back to the bridge builders of yesteryear, but I want to acknowledge all of the beautiful people that I share the head table with, and I want to acknowledge you, my classmates, my schoolmates, family, friends, and supporters of the Bunky Color George Washington Carver High School reunion. I can think of absolutely no other place that I would rather be at this moment, at this time, than yes. here with you. Yes. This is a grand, grand occasion. A grand occasion that would not be possible were it not for the group of people sitting right here. This is your steering committee. And I know sometimes they think we take them for granted, but believe me, I don't. Yes. Actually, I can't because I have a sister who has tortured herself and <laughs> me and others for the last two, but it's because she wanted everything to go well. Yes. And she had a wonderful group of people working with her. And when I tell people back uh, where I live, uh, what we get for the tax we pay for this, they tell me that I'm not telling the truth. And I said, yes, I am. It's kind of short of a miracle, really, that they do all that they do. With what, and we didn't start paying the $100 until 2010. So we should be eternally grateful for what they do. And they couldn't do it if they weren't able to uh, negotiate and plan and barter and communicate and work hard and just take, make all those extra efforts to make this night and this weekend a reality. So I want to applaud your appreciation. <laughs> now let's go back to our beloved bridge builders of yesteryear. As I said, I know you have lots and lots of memories. I'll tell you a few of mine. In the first grade, my teacher was Mrs. Nato White. And one of the earliest lessons I learned was about how to listen and follow instructions. Mrs. White told us to color the baby chicks yellow, and I colored mine black. <laughs> and it was my first introduction to the 12-inch ruler. She caught my little hand like this, and she tapped it just to sting me a little bit and said, learn how to follow directions and pay attention. That was my first lesson and it was one well learned. I don't always do that now, but I try. And it was a lesson that I learned in the first grade. When I was in the fifth grade, I had the best fifth grade teacher, I think, on this side of glory. Yes. Mrs. K.E.W. Lolly. And Mrs. Lolly taught me and all of my classmates, we were 10 years old, she told us, rather, that we had to memorize all of the words to the Negro National Anthem. I had absolutely no idea what the significance of that song was. All I knew was my teacher said, memorize it, and I was going to do it. I am so proud of the fact that I still know every verse of the Negro National Anthem and I've known it since the fifth grade. But I'm even prouder of the fact that I now appreciate it, understand it, and can relate to it. Thank you, Mrs. Love. And then there's Mr. Bass, my eighth grade teacher. We got in trouble, Mr. Bass, to say, Styles, come on up here. And I would go up, and he would get the strap out, you hold your hand out, and he would hit you, and then I would do this. He'd say, Styles, I don't have all day. <laughs> bring your hand back around, he would grab it. And when he grabbed it, you couldn't get away. And he gave you the rest of your licks, and then you went.
went back to your seat. Your feelings hurt more than anything, your hands stinging a little bit, but a lesson learned. Thank you, Mr. Bassett. I still remember. In the 10th grade, I had a teacher whose name was Mrs. Helen, Mrs. Helen Meyer. And Mrs. Meyer again had us to memorize a poem. It was called Invictus by William Ernest Henley. Again, 15 years old. I, I memorized the poem, but I didn't really appreciate its significance until much later when I realized what it was saying was, you ought to always want to be and be determined to be the master of your own faith and the captain of your own soul. Thank you, Mrs. Mike. Lesson well learned. Yeah. How about the L-I-A-L-O rally? Do you remember that? <coughs> The LIALO rally was probably one of the most single positive experiences that we had as young African American students in the public school system. I am so sorry that young people today don't get that experience. It was a, com a competition. It taught us how to compete. It taught us how to win with pride and how to lose with grace. And we were fired up because there were two parts to it. One had to do with the cultural part, which dealt with beating Bethune at uh, the choir thing and at the band thing. You remember that? Yeah. We got pumped up. We practiced and practiced. And when L-I-A-L-O rally time came, we were ready. But there was another part to that, too. There was an academic component. And we, our teachers took us under their wings and they nurtured us and they, they uh, helped us, they tutored us in the various academic subjects. Believe it or not, and I know you don't believe it, but it's true, I still have my English and my speech medal that I earned and won in the 10th and the 11th grade. I think it was a wonderful, wonderful experience and it's something that we will be sorely missed. And it left us when integration came. And I won't get into that. I think you already know how that, how that goes. But those are, some of the, those are some of the invaluable, invaluable experiences that we had with our bridge builders of yesteryear. Now, there was, they had some collaborative partners that helped them along the way. And they have been mentioned already. Those were our parents our guardians, our grandmothers, our godparents, our extended family, our churches, our neighborhoods. They all worked in concert with the teachers, and that's how you and I ultimately became who we are, because we got the nurturing at the bottom of the ring, and then we came up and we got all of the other things, but we had a wonderful, wonderful foundation. I am eternally grateful for the foundation that we received. And I know many times we had textbooks that had somebody else's name in it before we got it, like Boudreau and Broussard and Rabelais. But it was okay. We were able to take those books, even though they weren't brand new, and do whatever the same body of knowledge that, that was in there was the knowledge that was in the new book. So we worked it, and we worked it, and our teachers and our parents and everybody worked with us. And this is what happens when everyone nurtures and loves you, and prays for you, and instructs you, and criticizes you, and inspires you, and just give you everything that you need, and teach you how to be a, a self-respecting person thirsty for knowledge and wanting to be better than you were at that time. And that's why you're here today. So bridge builders of yesteryear, we thank you. Yes. Now, there might be a question that needs to be asked now, and I'm prepared to give you the answer. I have a provocative proposition. We've talked lovingly about our bridge builders of yesterday. Who are our bridge builders now? Yes. I have a provocative proposition. 
I want you to look to your right, the person that's seated to your right. You don't have anybody like Diane. Look up here, Diane. <laughs> look to your left and see who's seated to your left. Now look down at yourself. If the persons who are seated to your right and to your left, and if you attended Bunky Colored or George Washington Carver High School, and if you attended and or graduated, then you are looking at the bridge builders now. <coughs> you are the bridge builders now. Isn't that awesome? Yes. And you have been for some time, whether you knew it or not. You have been nurturing and serving as strong role models. You have been building character. You have been teaching by example, by the way you live. You don't all have to be in the classroom teaching. The best teaching is by example. And you've been doing it for years. And I want you to know that you must continue. You must continue. Now, what is the difference between bridge builders of yesteryear and bridge builders now? I'm glad you asked that question. Bridge builders of yesteryear made a conscious and deliberate decision to stay here in Bunky or in the surrounding area. Isn't that true? Yes. Most of them stayed here. They married here. They raised their families here. They had careers here. They retired here. And so they were here for us as we came in and out, needing to be uh, nurtured and reassured and still needing positive role models. But what did you, the bridge builders, now do? You made a decision, some of you, to stay. But many of you made a conscious decision to move yourselves all over these United States of America from sea to shining sea. You know what that means? Bunky is in the house everywhere. <laughs> and I am so proud If we look at Washington State, we'll find Dr. Emil Petrie there. He's been there for a while. He finally came to visit us for this reunion. He is making sure that that state understands that his foundation came from George Washington Carver High School. Yes. So we're proud of that. Yes. You look at Cole, Minnesota, you'll find Irma Jean, Calvin. And yes. if I call you by your maiden name, that's OK. That means everybody will know who I'm talking about. <laughs> and Irma Jean was talking to me the other day about when am I going to retire. And I told her very, very soon, 11 months to be exact. <laughs> so uh, she was telling me that she had, but she's a retired educator, and she has been making sure that Bunky is represented in Minnesota. Because uh, when I was in Africa many years ago, and some of the brothers and sisters wanted to know where I was from, and uh, I said, of course, America. And then I started trying to explain to them where Bunky was on the map. <laughs> of course, they didn't understand. But that's the kind of pride we have in where we've come from. That's the kind of pride we must always show. And then when we go down to South Carolina, there is Charles Pip Warner, Mr. Deb Debonair, uh, who is doing his thing at South Carolina State. And uh, he is helping to nurture and develop young men and women who want to be professionals in a given field. And we, we, we salute him for that. And then we go to Washington, D.C., and you've already heard from the eloquent attorney James Bernard Christian. What else do I need to say? He's representing Bunky in Washington, D.C. Yes. And we're very, very proud of that. Yes. And then you go to Kentucky, and there's Robert Frazier. And he has just been flouncing all over the place. <laughs> so you've seen it. And he does that, I'm sure, in Kentucky as well. McElroy McCree is here from Virginia. And I'm sure that he is representing us well. Mary Brown, who is in Arkansas now. And I, I can't tell you what you know her by her nickname, because she's been fussing at me all weekend by, because I called her that. 
Can I say it? Yes. yes. May May. <laughs> Forgive me, I'm sure. And then there's the huge state of California on the West Coast. Yes. We've got bunker nights from Northern California down south. They're all over the place. Yes. I will not stand here and try to name everybody in this audience tonight, but I'm just giving you an idea. And of course, you know where you fit, even if your name isn't called, and we, we just can't call everybody's name, but in Northern California, there is Robert, the, uh, Robert, and then we have Thelma also, Hill. And they have been in California for many, many, many years. And uh, they're representing us ably there, Bunny, that is. And then we have Aris Foley. Yes. Right yes. here. In the house. In the house. <laughs> That's right. We have uh, my classmate, Jewel Keller Collins, and my tiny classmate, Ethel Prescott, who is better known as Tiny. And we have um, Thelma Jean Burks registered. I don't know whether they're here yet, but she registered. And um, we have Mr. Leroy Compton, who came to visit us this time. And, <laughs> and we're pleased. And uh, I understand that four of his sisters are here from all other parts, Linda and Bessie, Grace. And so we're glad to see all of them. And of course, Amelda Sterling Compton is a fixture now for this reunion. She said she's not going to miss it. Yeah. And Margie Sterling Hawkins. Yeah. And so, we, and we could go on and on and on. Uh, uh, Jane Dr. Caligari is here. And, and, and there are many others. J.B. Nichols is also a regular. He's always here. Um, Shirley Shepard dropped in today, I saw her, Shirley yeah. Shepard Davis. And, uh, and, we, and we could go on and on, but what, what I'm saying to you is that you're a bridge builder and you're a different kind because you have chosen to take yourself beyond the city limits of Bunky, and so you're still expected to do what our bridge builders of yesteryear did who stayed here. Uh, I challenge you to do that, in fact. And if you move over to Texas, we'll never stop calling people. <laughs> so I, you know, I'll just say Texas, 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 and, uh, you know, Dallas, and where uh, uh, Julia Wilkinson Jackson is, and uh, Dallas, where my brother is, Calvin Stein. And then when you go to, you know, you can go to Port Arthur and Austin and Beaumont and Houston. And if you go to Houston, I think the West is probably uh, own uh, part of Houston. There's a lot of, there's a lot of Wests in Houston. And, uh, and they are making a difference there. My classmate, Rosa West Word, who introduced me, uh, because of her outstanding work with the Girl Scouts of America, I don't think they'll ever be the same as you. And that's one of her passions and one of her loves, and I know that because she's told me about it through the years. And I want to talk about a group of men because you know we have we're having trouble with our young African American men. And I want to get to retire, and the quality of your life does not have to change because you've shown up year after year after year, and you've earned the right to retire. And there are many of you like that in this audience. Your work ethics cannot be questioned. And I want you to proudly, proudly talk to African American men in, your, in the towns where you reside now, in your churches, everywhere, and let them know that there is something positive in, in having strong character, in having a word and wanting to work and make an honest living instead of stealing from somebody else. Uh, let them know that. And some of you are shining examples because you've done it for so long, you're now retired. Many of you. Clifton West, S.L. Sweezy, Daniel Payton. You know, and there are, there, are, there are many, many, many of you. And those who, have, those who have not retired, many continue to work. Gregory Maya and Gregory Wick, they're continuing to work. And then there are strong men just right in, in this in the area here. Um, Butch Baptiste. 
and uh, Doris's husband, Lawrence Hope. And uh, I'm looking at Don sitting right here, Don Frazier, and Albert Frazier. I can't see good, so anyway, Albert Frazier. And, and there are so many of you out there whose names I won't call, but please feel compelled. And don't let retirement stop you, because I want to let you know that retirement has not got you off the hook. So all it means is you have more time now to be a stronger bridge builder. That's so I, I don't want you to think that because you're retired, it's all over, because it is not. Uh, so the strong work ethics is something that we need to promote with our young black men, especially, and with all of our young children. There's a group of uh, uh, people that I call the full circle people in the audience. I call them full circle because they, they went out uh, to all other parts of the country and they built careers, they raised children, and they became grandparents. And then many of them decided to return to Louisiana. So they've done full circle. And they're back with a wealth of experience and knowledge to share. Many of them are retired, but they're willing to still work and do whatever they can to make sure that they're passing on this rich legacy that we got from our bridge builders of yesteryear. And I'm speaking of Eola Lewis Hobb and Mateen West Patterson, Evelyn Stiles Jones, Lynette Baptiste, my classmates Rosa Bonton Tillett and Wilma Jackson Holt, Betty Washington, Don Prescott, Willie Moses Gaines and Thelma Gaines, and James Stiles, and Oscar William Jr., who I was so happy to see uh, this weekend. Those are just some examples. There are others here, but to have come back full circle is something that is wonderful because you have so much now to bring back home. And home can be here in Bunkett or in the surrounding areas. But I challenge you to take your full circle experience and put it to work. Down in the neck of the country where I live, we have some wonderful, wonderful Carver High School bridge building. We have Harold Rita, that I'm looking at now. That's Mayor Harold Rita, I want yeah. you to know. Yeah. Uh, Harold has been the mayor either two times or three. I can't keep up. Uh, Harold is the mayor of Baker, Louisiana. And Baker is to Baton Rouge what Pineville is to Alexandria, probably. I think that's probably close enough. But we're very proud of him. And he's a bridge builder there because uh, in the position that he has, he has the rich opportunity to touch and to influence many, many lives, and he's doing that. And Maud Ross is in that mood. Maud Alice has retired two or three times already. And, uh, and you know what? She loves what she's doing. She tried to retire the first time. She ended up crossing the line going over to Mississippi to do the same thing. Then she came back, and she's still doing it. And she's doing such a marvelous job until they're just trying to hold on to her. She's a bridge builder now, a bridge builder now. And we are so proud of what she's doing. Across town from where I am, there's a young man who is at Louisiana State University. He's at LSU. He's an executive administrator. He is really what I call an academic superstar. He has single-handedly been responsible for having developed and made it possible for more African Americans to earn the PhD in chemistry at LSU than anybody else in its history. His name is Dr. Isaiah Warner. treasures all out here, everywhere. And what we have to do is take those treasures and use them. We have to take those treasures and use them. Now let's come down to Bunky, where you really are walking in the footsteps of the bridge builders of yesteryear. There are many people who chose after high school not to leave Bunky, and thank God they did. 
because we needed somebody to stay here to keep things going and to, to, to contribute, making valuable contributions as they have done. And I'm speaking of people like Ali Ray Tahata and Irma Stevenson and Brenda Callahan Sampson and her husband Gaylord Sampson and Dolores Keys at Baptiste and Patty Warner and Doretha Pleasant Wade and Doris Wade Hope. These are the people that I'm talking about. And there, there are others, Doris Fontenot, uh, Bobby Christmas, Earlene Augustine, Lillian Prescott Williams. And Linda Prescott moved right up to Alexandria, but she's here most of the time, so we count her as being in the area as well. And Rosalie Mays. And there are many, many others that I, whose names I can call. But these are people who chose to stay in and around the monkey to keep things going here so that we would have something somewhere, I guess, to come back to. So we, in fact, like this reunion. If it were not for many of these people, we would not be able to do, to be here today, communing the way we are. And I want to now move to the educators who decided to stay in a near bunker. Patricia Ambrose Walker, Diane Shepard, Belle McKellar, Doris Spears Leary, Gilda Compton, Connie Stevenson, -Lewis. I'm just naming a few. But these are people who really walked right in the footsteps of the bridge builders of yesteryear. They decided to stay and decided they wanted to be just like them. And I am eternally grateful that they decided to do that. And then we have some bridge builders now who are fashioning themselves or who have, they've already done it, their careers after Principal P.A. Frazier and Principal F. Paul Augustine. And I'm speaking of Principal retired Rufus Johnson, Principal Warren Patterson, and Principal Madeline Washington Miller. These were, these are fine, fine, fine educators who retired, but the mark is there forever. Yeah. And they will continue to do what they can to shape and to influence the lives of young people. Now, the last group of people are, I call legacy bridge builders. And they are legacy bridge builders because they are walking or have walked directly in the steps of bridge builders of yesterday. I'm speaking of Betty Rose Hayward, who has walked in the giant footsteps of Lucy Hayward. Lucy Hayward was a bridge builder of yesterday. I'm speaking of Maud Richmond Ross, who walked in the awesome steps of Alice Richmond. I'm speaking of Cherry Alfred Callahan, who walked in the beautiful steps of Queen Esther Alfred. I'm speaking of Carol Glenn Ronnie's, who walked in the awesome footsteps of Merle Glenn. I'm speaking of Barbara Jones, who is walking in the awesome footsteps of Luella Zachary. And I'm speaking of Priscilla Burks and Dolores Burks, who are walking in the footsteps of Maple Burks. And I'm speaking of Thelma Frazier Wright, who is walking or has walked in the footsteps of Rosetta Frazier. Those are powerful legacies. And we are so proud of them. But what we're proudest of is although we didn't have those direct footsteps to step in, we have stepped on anyway, and we have been influenced positively anyway. So as I close, I challenge you tonight. I challenge you tonight to determine that you are going to be not just a bridge builder now, but a bridge builder now par excellence. And that takes a little something extra. If, you have, if you're retired and you decided it's all over and you're laid back and you're not 
it, it just, just decide I'm going to do just a little bit more. Are you needed now to do that? I can tell you without hesitation that as long as the statistics for African Americans remain as dark as they are now, you are sorely needed. As long as you have little African American teenage girls still giving birth out of wedlock, as long as you have HIV, the HIV virus running rampant in the African American community, you need to be a bridge builder par excellence. As long as you have more African American males incarcerated than you have in college, you need to be a bridge builder par excellence. As long as you have African American young people from the ages of 16 to perhaps 26, killing each other every single day, then you need to know that there is bridge building work to do. I ask you now to decide on this 10th year reunion that you're going to do more. And I leave you with, uh, here's another poem that, uh, and, and I, I, I I learned it in high, I memorized it in high school. I don't remember which teacher. I can't even remember the author. But my sister, Henrietta, looked it up one time and she told me. But I was already too far gone in my senior years, so I don't remember what she told me. But, uh, but the poem is a powerful one. And I want to leave it with you. It's called Myself. I have to live with myself. And so, I want to be fit for myself to know. I want to be able, as days go by, always to look myself straight in the eye. I don't want to keep on a closet shelf a lot of secrets about myself and fool myself as I come and go into thinking that no one else will know the kind of person I really am. I don't want to dress up myself in sham. I don't want to look at myself and know that I'm a bluster and a bluff and an empty show. I can never hide myself from me. I see what others can never see. I can never fool myself. And so whatever happens, I want to be self-respecting and conscience-free. Congratulations on our 10 years. And I ask you, bridge builders now, Go forth and make the bridge builders of yesteryear proud. Thank you. After undergraduate school, I moved to the Sand Hills of Nebraska, where I was the only African American in the whole community of 2000. After being there for a couple of years, a friend came to me one day and said, you know, you often talk about this little town in Louisiana where you were raised called Bunky. And we know it must have taken courage for you to come here. And then she said, you know, I'm very glad that my son had you as his speech pathologist because that gave me a chance to get to know you. And she said, you know, there aren't many people, especially African Americans, who are willing to move across the country to a community where they know there are no other African Americans. Then she went on to say, we are glad that you're here because you have acclimated so well with us. And I very proudly said, that's because of my bunky colored Carver High Foundation. Good evening, schoolmates and classmates, and to all of the supporters and friends of our reunion. I think that you would probably agree with me that there are two words in the English language that are very, very powerful. And those two words are love and service. 
you're very familiar with the love part because you've been experiencing that and giving it all of your life to special ones in your life. And I won't ask you who they are, but you know who they are. And you've been giving that love. But service, I hope you've been giving as well. Service is that that we do for others without expecting anything in return. And that's pretty powerful. We have a group of class, a group of students in a certain class among us tonight. And I have been watching and observing them now for several years. A small nucleus, not the entire class, because you know it doesn't take all of us, although that would be ideal. But those of you who are doers and students of the Word know that the Word says, where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I'll be in the midst. I believe that when they have gathered those who, and there's a nucleus, I think 14, 15, 16, I'm not sure how many. But I have observed them through the years, and they have demonstrated a, not just service, but I have enjoyed and admired the kind of special relationship that they demonstrate among themselves as classmates. They have used technology very wisely, and so they email, they fax, they phone, and they do all of those things that will make them closer without necessarily having to be there physically. And then I have also seen them fly across the country, one or two of them, to maybe go to a funeral of a loved one of a classmate or to attend a wedding. I've seen them sit quietly with a classmate who has lost a loved one. And I have just admired and been just a little bit envious of them. I'm sitting over here with my classmates this evening, and I am so proud to be with them, as I know you are of your classmates. But I envy the relationship that this class has rekindled. And not only have they done that, but they have embraced the concept of service. And I am thoroughly impressed with that. They have decided that they wanted to put their money where their mouths were. And they have quietly, without fanfare, been awarding scholarships to young African-American young ladies and gentlemen who graduated from Bunky High School. And some of you probably didn't even know that, but I am aware of it. I don't think that they are aware that you are honoring them tonight. In fact, you aren't even aware. But I decided to be presumptuous because I knew that you would want me to. And I knew that you would want to do this. And so I have taken the liberty of deciding and asking this committee, and they have been very generous in allowing me to come to present a special award to this class. And the award is a plaque, and I tried to get it in our colors. I asked Ambrose with this red or burgundy or maroon, I'm not sure. But I, I hope that it will make it out. They did put the silver writing on it, so that's nice. And it says, Special Class Award presented by Bunky Colored High slash George Washington Carver High School Class Reunion. And then on this first plate is the class year and tonight's or today's date. And ladies and gentlemen, this plaque this year goes to that class that I think has done so much to show us what we can do in exchange for the space that God has so graciously allowed us to occupy on this earth, the rent that we can pay, and we pay it by serving others. I speak of none other than the class of 1971, and I would like for all of the members of that class to hear the speaking to come forward.
<laughs> but the reason I know so much about what they do is because my sister is, of course, in this class, and I see how much work she does. And they all do the same thing. They're emailing, they're calling, and I'm here at Gregory, and I'm here at Grandpa, and I'm here at Doris, and this one and that one all the time. And when someone, they lose a loved one, I know about it because it, it, it gets, you know, it gets around and I hear about it and they support each other. And I think it's wonderful. And I know that time is far spent, but I believe that this is time that is really, really uh, deserving of them. Uh, they have done so much and I hope that they will inspire you. I am serious when I say that I'm challenging my class now and they will be hearing from because uh, the speaker talked about it and some other people might have said something tonight, I'm not sure, about how seriously we need to do something to inspire and to help our young people. I was uh, in a meeting on, on yesterday and I was, I was fortunate enough to hear General Honoré speak and you know who he is, the general who wrote in to, to New Orleans to put everything in order. But anyway, he, he gave some chilling statistics. And it makes this plaque all the more important. He was saying that a study had been done, and they were studying fourth grade African American boys, trying to see how many boys were in the fourth grade across America at this time. And they were going to use that number to project by the next, in the next 14 years, by the time they were, well, not 14, but by the time they were 18. They were going to project how many additional prisons they would need to build. I, I can't say it more, but, but you understand what I'm saying. So that makes the work that they do all the more important. And I want you to join me in challenging them. And I hope that when we come back to the next reunion, we will be able to say that the class of 61 has done some scholarships and the class of 63 and, and all of the other classes. And we need to take charge, as the speaker has said. It's our destiny, and we're all tied together. And I salute them, and I am going to take the liberty, if I may, to ask one of them to come forward and don't speak as long as I have. And say something for one minute uh, in acceptance of this award.
and efforts to ensure this renewal of success. Lastly, I want to encourage you all to enjoy yourselves and bask in the tradition of excellence that was followed by school. I welcome you all to reconnect and rejoice in the moment of this in such a joyous occasion. I will leave you, my fellow in my bunch of colors called the high school city. Welcome home. Thank you. Well, good evening, fellow graduates and friends of all who have assembled. It is certainly a distinct honor for me to return back home and be here with all of you. You don't know how it makes my heart glad to see so many of you returning home and assemble here to continue the great tradition of honoring that which has put us in the places that we are today. A great legacy of Father High School and those who live long and hard to shape our lives that we are enjoying today. It is my distinct honor and pleasure also to announce, as we decided to, two years ago, the establishment of the Paul High School Class of 66 Book Scholarship Award. And we decided as a class that it was not enough just to come home and to spend the time, but to also leave something behind uh, to help those who call upon us who would seek to further their education. And therefore, the clients have established a $500 per student scholarship each year for the highest graduating senior uh, from the Buffalo High School, African American female, and African American male. We thank the class of 66 for involving and supporting this effort. In recognition of the fact that so many of our classmates um, have not had an opportunity to really be in touch with each other in the interim, we are launching the scholarship tonight uh, with a voluntary contribution of $3,000 with the class then to match that dollar for dollar for the next two years, uh, raising the total amount up to $6,000. And our commitment is that we will have $10,000 in order to prevent a scholarship each year for the next 10 years. <laughs> From that point forward, we will just dig deep and try to add another $10,000 to it. Uh, so we are pleased that the commitment is there and uh, the class is standing behind moving ahead. So tonight, uh, we want to present our inaugural scholarships. Uh, to the highest academically achieving graduate of the Warner High School, and I'm informed uh, that each one of these uh, recipients tonight are here with their parents. And uh, I'm going to present the first uh, inaugural scholarship to Miss Destiny Wool. Destiny? <laughs> and you come forward. And as she's coming forward, I'd also like to have Destiny's parents. Please join us on stage, Destiny. Wonderful. Let's come forward. Let's give this young lady a little round of applause. Mr. Cottrell Smith. 
To be ignorant of what happened before you were born is to be ever a child. For what is a man's lifetime, unless the memory of past events is woven with those of earlier times? The beginning of our school experience struggles, challenges, and errors. The progress of the Negro school was very slow in the early 1900s. According to Stephen Nicotti, in his thesis titled The History of Public Education of Owens Parish, 1852-1937, which was submitted to Louisiana State University in 1940, the school board gave small amounts of money to the Negro school and money. Quoting the printed words, in a matter of building, the school board gave the new Negroes the same form of assistance given in previous years. The following resolution will illustrate the assistance given to the Negroes. Resolved that $300 be appropriated to build a color school in Bucky, provided the local darkies bear all other expenses. End of course. A barrier, truly a barrier. However, the remarkable men and women of this community hurled this and other barriers, overcame challenges, and blazed on. In 1909, Alfred Fielders started Bucky Colored Public School in a house that served as a school and as a hospital. Professor Landry served as the first principal, followed by Professor Smith and Williams. Two teachers are noted to have served during this time. According to the Dakota's research, it was hard to find qualified teachers of color. And a program was set up for Negro teachers to take classes during the summer months. This kept the teachers and the students. The school continued to expand with buildings, teachers, and students. In 1937, Professor Rowe became principal. Students walked to school from near and far. You may have heard your parents talk about, talk about how far and how many miles they had to walk, rain or sunshine. They also had to walk outside a couple of blocks to get their lunch. Mr. Rowe had a garden plan to help supply the food for the cafeteria to serve the students. The male students were responsible for the upkeep of the drill of the garden. This also enabled them to learn more agricultural trying skills, which could be used in gardening at home. Mr. Rowe also ministered his own proficiency test, which served as a requirement for students passing from the seventh grade to high school. The school personnel and the men and women of this community are monuments to the continuation of the growth of our schools. One teacher even taught the eighth grade class in her home. They would have to leave the house and walk down to the lunch room for their lunch. Under the administration of Mr. Forrest Augustine, who became principal in the year that I was born, and also many in the class of 1963, 1945. He filed Mr. Rowe as principal of Bunchy School. Some of the principal Augustine's major accomplishments were working with the school board to increase the teaching staff, improve and expand the curriculum, provide hot lunches, provide bus transportation, and he organized a community school club which raised over $1,700 to build a school auditorium, which he also made use as our cafeteria. The bus transportation enabled students who lived in rural areas a better opportunity to complete high school. Several small schools for colored students around the monkey were closed and the students were transferred to Lundy High School, Lundy Colored High School. With this expansion, the school's name was changed to Lundy Consolidated High School. Mr. Chris Albert Frazier became principal after the bridge building of our 
Robert Mark Steen retired in 1956. In the second year of his administration, the school name was changed from Black Consolidated High School to George Washington Park High School. I recall that we had to research this man, George Washington Park. It was overwhelming, yet exciting. Wow, was it informative. As I reflected on the theme, preserving the history, the culture, the heritage, I realized that part of this story is a reflection of our culture, heritage, and history. What did we learn about George Washington Carver? The biography of George Washington Carver by Rack Rackham Post states that he was born a slave in 1864 to Moses and Susan Carter in Diamond Grove, Missouri. He pioneered agricultural research on his journey from slavery to becoming a world-renowned agricultural chemist. He actively promoted al alternative crops to cotton and methods to prevent soil depletion. His profound knowledge of botany and agriculture enabled him to devise ways to help the economically submerged post-Civil War South to better ways of living. Carl was convinced that the research, that the results of research must be brought directly into the lives of the people. In 1906, he designed a horse-drawn wagon that took his exhibits, books, and findings to remote districts in the South and also to poor farmers. He believed that this was the most significant contribution educating black farmers. So faced with many challenges, he showed constancy in life. His aim was to learn, appreciate the life around him, strive to be a better human being. He was honorable and courageous. Carter had been ranked with the great men of the 20th century. Do those. Carl was the first black student to enter all white Simpson College in Iowa to study piano and art without an official high school diploma. His art teacher, impressed by his ability with plants, encouraged him to change his focus to agriculture and transfer to all white Iowa State. College in Ames, Iowa. A building is named after George Washington Carver on Iowa State College campus, and they have a festival every year honoring George Washington Carver. He received a bachelor and a master's degree in agriculture, and he also became a faculty member at Iowa State College. He was a professor and department head of Agriculture at Tuskegee Institute. He was appointed a collaborator with the United States Department of Agriculture to work on the study of plant disease. He gave his life savings of $60,000 to his research foundation at Tuskegee Institute to provide opportunities for African-American students in the advanced studies of botany and chemistry. He was the first African-American to have a monument erected. With that research, I thought, what a role model for students at George Washington Carver High School. Mr. Frazier and many of our teachers constantly reminded us of his accomplishments and tried to encourage us to move on and do the same. Without our school, without our school name, we got a mascot. According to the Free Dictionary, a mascot is a person animal or object supposed to bring good luck or used as a symbol of an organization. Our mascot was the eagle. The eagle is considered to be the king of the sky, a very large bird of prey with keen eyes. They are noted for their strength, their size, their powers of flight, their vision, and their shrewdness. We were of uh, the Eagles. We also had a school song. The culture of our school is illuminated in our school song. As we see each standard, one can see the significance of the teachers who motivated our learning. We were inspired by the wisdom of our teachers. Their greatest joy were to see us be successful. 
girls' basketball program expanded, and they competed outside of the pair with other girls and boys basketball teams. A football program was developed. The home economic student was also added. Thus, the historical foundation of the school established a culture and heritage. Culture is a word for people's way of life, meaning the way groups do things. Culture is who we are and what shapes our identity. A culture is passed on to the next generation through teaching, one's observation, and learning of that group's values, languages, beliefs, ideas, and symbols. While many of us came from different households, different cultures, we were expected to and had to conform to the culture of Bucky Color, George Washington Carver High School, when we entered the school building. The teachers and other school workers' job was to make that culture a cooperative and harmonious one, so that everyone could feel comfortable and learning could be achieved. It wasn't always easy to conform to the culture of the school, nor was it always easy to conform to the culture of the city kids or the kids who rode the buses. Our principals served more than one role. They were role models. They also taught classes. According to the written history, our fourth principal, in addition to being principal, taught math and English. Our fifth principal, Mr. Forrest Augustine, would drive around town, and if he, <laughs> if he found you skipping, if you knew Mr. Augustine, you knew that you were in trouble because you had to go to his office and get the and you would call home and you would probably end up getting the same thing when you got home. So today he called that job a fluency worker. But he also taught math. He performed many tasks, each of our principals did. Mr. Frazier, our last principal, would provide transportation for students. He also spent time talking to parents and families. Many of our teachers visited our home if there was a problem or a concern. Some teachers stayed out of school to help students with their schoolwork. Some teachers even gave independent study for those students who were more advanced in any subject, and they did not want to hold them in time, building a cultural heritage. The concept of heritage has gradually been expanded to embrace living culture and contemporary expression. Heritage encompasses tangible and intangible access, immovable and documentary access, inherited from the past, and transmitted to future generations by virtue of their irreplaceable value. What we call a joint Washington high school's heritage history and culture is being preserved through these reunions. By the sharing of the stories, by sharing your experiences, <coughs> by recalling and documenting the actions happening, we now are uh, now being recorded with video. So we have DVDs and CDTs that are being recorded on. Also pictures in our souvenir book. Heritage is one of the most important conditions for the maintenance of a community of memory and their effect. To preserve the heritage can also mean to preserve a set of committed connections to one's given memory. A preserved heritage would be a maintained talk. Julio Francisco and also states that people preserve their heritage to maintain and reinforce its cultural identity. It's, as a matter of fact, a question of identity. It is quote. The preservation of cultural heritage is central to protecting a sense of who we are. The only way to protect the culture is by practicing it. Culture and cultural heritage can give us a sense of belonging and provide insight, insight from which we come. It can also provide a way of life. A typical day at this Don Keller George Washington High School began with a devotional period. Anybody 
bodies. We pray to God that you would bless those that prepared it. We thank you for this food. We thank you for this event, for this evening. We pray to God that food shall be consumed for the nourishment of our bodies and that we shall continue to enjoy good health, long life, and longevity. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We are fortunate and blessed to have represented at this reunion the following classes. 
And I'm going to ask each class to stand and let us know you are here. 1942, the oldest reunion participants. Mrs. Orly Turner, who happens to be the oldest registered alumni, would you please stand and give her a hand.
graduate from Boston High School. District Boys Basketball Champs. <laughs> Class of 1974, youngest reunion participants. Michelle Renee Bradley and Credenza Compton. My, my daughter and Diane Shepherd's goddaughter, I had to say that. Our souvenir booklet was done by Small Town Creation, Desktop Publishing Services, and more. Honor Felicia Walker, and her mother is here also, Miss Patricia Walker. Would Felicia please stand? Because she did such a good job on the career business this year. Thank you, classes and guests. We hope that you enjoy the rest of the 2008 Bunking Color High Carver High School reunion. Thank you very much. To the Rangers, Mr. Hayward, and your steering committee, other committees. Ministers of the Gospel, visiting friends, my aluminum family, which includes the precious class of 1957. Thanks to Mrs. Diana Shepherd for inviting me to share a portion of our past with you tonight, relishing the past. What am I really saying when I say relishing the past? I'm simply saying we are enjoying and appreciating what has existed or taken place in a period before the present. The past that I know began in September 1945 under the principalship of Mr. Forrest Paul Augustine. Our school was housed in a white frame building without central air. You young people listen to that. We did not have modern restroom accommodations. Our basketball team did not play on hardwood floors at that time, but on the dust of the earth. Students marched daily with pride to an old, unpainted building to get lunch and not a fork was touched until we sang, Thou art great and thou art good. And we thank thee for our food. Bow our heads, must we be fed. Give us, Lord, our daily bread. Amen. We have a unique past because we had a principal and teachers, some who are here tonight, who loved us and were concerned about us. They worked hard and untiringly with very little pay to instill in us the value of an education. They also taught us to love and care for each other and our family. Yes, <clears throat> they believed in discipline, and thank God they did, because no one had to call a police officer to our school. 
We had Mr. Augustine and the bridge builders, <coughs> as they are known, with their red tan straps. As time moved on, God blessed us with a brick facility known as George Washington Carver High School, which included a modern cafeteria, home economics cottage, industrial arts building, and a well-equipped gymnasium. Hallelujah to the King. Our basketball team were through kicking dust. They were now on hardwood floors. Praise God. We were able to read and study from books fresh from the press in lieu of the used books that were given us by other schools. However, this did not stop us from studying diligently, nor our teachers from teaching religiously. Another thing that we can appreciate or relish about our past is the unity that existed between the principal, teachers, parents, churches, and the community. Baccalaureate and graduations were the highlights of our school year because the community looked forward to these events. We can truly thank God tonight for Bunky Colored High School with its role of bridge builders our dear parents and our community who made such a great impact on and a huge investment in our lives. I personally salute the memory of Mrs. Keziah L. Nora White Lolly, who allowed me as a fifth grade student to assist her with her green register, which were my first lessons in bookkeeping. Later led to other bookkeeping experiences, and finally to a career in the clerical field. Need a little light here. Aren't you glad that you were there in the past? We are the school's memory. Not only are we the school's memory, but we are the mentors for the younger students today. When we cease to be involved in our heritage, it will suffer from amnesia. And a loss of memory means there is no one to remind us of our history. We have a little problem with these eyes, excuse me. That light, yes. Watch out. How can alumna that forget what God has done in the past learn to trust God for their present and future? Let us march on, schoolmates. Let us pass the torch of education to those who are in need of it. Let us make known our rich school heritage. These school reunions let me know that love, 
peace, and harmony still exist in our school family and in our world today. To God be the glory for the great things that he has done. Good evening, and may God bless each of you. To my alumni members, and all of you that are here tonight, it is a pleasure to be here. And among us, I'm very proud, with the class of 1967 of Carver High School, I would like to say thank you to Mrs. Diana, chairperson of this banquet committee, for having asked me to assist in the speaking of this program. I told everybody that I'm not really a speaker, I can run my mouth, but tonight I'm just going to tell you a little bit of how we manage the present. Life in the 21st century. Our religion, creedless. Our faith, godless. Our labor, effortless. Our conduct, worthless. Our religion or our relation, loveless. Our attitude, careless. Our feeling, heartless. Our politics, shameless. Our follies, countless. Our argument, faceless. Our commitment, aimless. Our poor, We're managing our present. How? I'll tell you in just a little. Less and less time, more and more. Not enough hours. Researchers recently discovered that all of us are cramming hours of life in a 24 hour period. Thanks to the modern technology of this world today. Time saving gizmos. Head to those on their laptops and Blackberry. Headset to join a conference call. Radio and on the navigation schedule. We're multitasking like crazy right now. We squeeze more into our busy lives. Technology, believe it or not, has made us better, or has it made us worse? Because we shoehorn about seven additional hours.
Compared to a decade ago, primitive 1998, you know, back then where nobody had heard anything about there was never enough time. When was there ever enough? The pyramids weren't built in a day to complete their job. Generation has its own trials and tribulations to get through, and every generation seems to echo the same complaint. There just aren't enough hours in the day. Just take my schedule for an example. I'm up at 5.30 in the morning, and I'm moving about getting everybody else to move because it seems as though I'm the only one that have a clock that has an alarm on it. I get things moving, and I'm uh, going from the washer to the dryer, changing clothes from one to the other. I make breakfast. I make sure that something is taken out for dinner. I do a little house cleaning, and I make sure that everything that they need, they have everything they need for that school day. That just isn't enough time in the day. When I get to work, there is a blur of emails. There are phone calls that have to be answered. There are conference calls that have to be done, and there are meetings that have to be attended. But that's how we run our lives. And with all that in mind today, we're faced with the soaring prices of gasoline, food, and clothing. But we're managing today. I am a firm believer of the fact that what you did yesterday will benefit you today. Sister Bacon told us about the past and how we lived back then. And I do believe that because of the way we live back then, then we are able to manage our present. Do you remember when our parents used to tell us, make your bed hard, but you'll lay in it? In other words, they were telling us that the seeds that we sowed yesterday will be the harvest that you reap today. Be careful. We have been taught by the best, those who have mastered and overcome oppression. We have been taught that no matter what is thrown in your path of life, you must not give up, but strive on for perfection and success. Don't be upset if you don't get what you ask for. Because some of the things that we want and ask for, it's not good for us at all. We were told to follow the three R's. Respect yourself, respect others, and accept responsibility for your actions. Yes, we manage the presence by following the three R's, remembering what we were taught and leaning and depending on Jesus. It tells us that we should trust in the Lord with all our hearts and lean not unto our own understanding. And in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. The way has been paved for you by the masters of the trade, your parents and your school teachers of yesterday. You can and you are managing the present by presenting yourselves as role models for those of tomorrow. For now, focus on finding peace and harmony in the present, and we will succeed.
Thank you. I'd like to thank the illustrious steering committee members for choosing me to speak with you tonight on impact in the future. Any one of us could have been called upon to talk about the future. We listen to the news, we read the papers. Here's some of the things that the economists and the experts say about the future. The Labor Department reported that American employers cut 49,000 jobs last month, the fifth straight month of job losses. This event definitely signals a recession for sure. Home prices fell in the first quarter of 2008. Lending institutions are tightening lending standards on loans. Inflation has remained high, largely reflecting continually increasing in the price of globally traded products. We have very little, and in some cases, 0% savings and a very high rate of debt. Don't even mention health care, energy costs, financial budgeting in our government, and our children's education. The cost is staggering. I work in the oil industry, but I am not here to defend it. I, as a consumer, suffer the same high prices of fuels as you do. Our economic stimulus or our rebate check, instead of going into our pockets, went mostly into our gas tank. When gasoline was selling, at a cost closer to a dollar, at the beginning of the decade, American households were spending $300 billion each year to drive their cars and heat and, and cool their homes. They are now spending $700 billion a year in energy costs. Even if the national gas prices stay around $4 a gallon, we're still going to be spending billions and billions of dollars in cost. The basics like food and clothing, air travel, and family vacations are all impacted by oil prices that are continuing to rise. It takes the toll on our foreseeable future. Talking with one of my girlfriends who is a law professor at Florida A&M, these words kept coming up, these buzzwords, generational diversity. You ever heard of that? Generational diversity. That means that our children are now part of a fast-paced environment. They are so different from us. Everything is fast-paced. Everything is quick. Everything is information-driven. They want information now. They text us instead of calling us. They email us instead of writing us. But they are our future. One dynamic speech speaker, the Reverend Dr. T.D. Jakes, mentioned a story about a young lady who, who wanted to enter a field that was not traditionally entered into by women. Fortunately, she was encouraged to continue and pursue that career by one of her professors, one of her teachers, encouraged her. 
She became a leader in the engineering industry and has created and patented so many life-saving devices. You know what she did after that? She reached back and she encouraged the next generation. She made sure that the young ladies knew that there is no limit to what you can do. You use your God-given talents for what he has put into your heart, regardless of traditionally, if it has not been in your, uh, in your field as a woman. The same way with the children of our future. The children of our future are much, much wiser. You ever get any of your grandkids who are 10 years old to come and operate your computer for you? You ever had your little niece, your little nephew to break it down and make it faster? You ever had your cell phone where you didn't know exactly how to text it and they come and hook it up for you? That's our future. Those are the kids that are gonna be running our future. But you know what this generational diversity speaks about? It speaks about these children who, because they do not have heroes in their lives, they want quick answers. They don't necessarily want to depend upon anyone. But here's the key, and here's the secret to impact in the future. Look back at the past. Listen to the people who lived during that time. That's what we did. And look how successful we are. We listened and we were influenced by the experiences of the past. We took it into our present. We became citizens who were not going to sit back. Look what's going on today. You've got a black person running for president? Don't you know that the sky is the limit? But here is how we impact the future. The torch that we were given from our past is going to be what we use to light our future. The torch. My future is so much brighter. I can see. The torches have been passed. I can see my way into the future. That's how we impact it. We each one teach one. We operate on a no-fail system. We help each other. We leave no one behind. We walk together and we do it hand in hand. I'm no better than you. You're no better than me. But together, we're awfully, awfully dynamite. Be a torchbearer. Thank you, torchbearers, for lighting my future. I'm taking that responsibility, and I'm moving forward. And I am going to light your child's future, your grandchild's future, because they are our future. Thank you.